working drummer. Now kick it. This is the Working Drummer Podcast, serving up perspectives, experiences, and stories from ground-level working pros. Advice, tips, and secrets on how to build a career in the music business. Welcome to the podcast, Working Drummer. My name is Matthew Krauss, and I'll be your host. Today, my guest is Zach Albetta. Zach's name should be familiar to you because he is the other host of this podcast. Zach earned his master's degrees in percussion performance and jazz and studio performance at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Zach has proved his abilities as an accomplished drummer by successfully navigating through three major music scenes, including Kansas City, Missouri, Los Angeles, and most recently, Atlanta, where he has become the go-to for some of the best talent in the Southeast. As always, you can go to workingdrummer.net. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can also find us on iTunes where you can subscribe and a new episode will be sent to you. Please give us a rating and write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow so much and we appreciate all that. Today's episode is sponsored in part by Sakai Drums. You know the Sakai sound, now get to know the Sakai name. Trusted around the world for almost 100 years, Sakai's devotion to craftsmanship and passion in creating the world's best quality drums is unmatched. Handcrafted in Osaka, Japan, Sakai offers the most versatile drums from the Trilogy Vintage Series to the modern Almighty Japanese Birch Recording Kit, each boasting a distinct sound and feel. Go to SakaiDrums.com to learn why studio legends Eddie Bears, the Smashing Pumpkins Jimmy Chamberlain, the Tedeschi Trucks Band J.J. Johnson, and Tyler Greenwell choose Sakai. Elevate your sound with Sakai, www.sakaidrums.com. So let's get to it. Here is Zach Albetta. Well, here we are. Yes, at long last. And here you are, in my house. Yep. Zach, uh, this is good, because I was thinking we we're going to have to do this over the over the phone. <laughs> this We've done good. everything else over the phone that's so right, far. That's right, that's yeah. right. Uh, yeah. So I, I we don't I don't normally do this, but I, I've got to do this. I've got to do like a somewhat of an intro, okay. kind of thing. Yeah. To let so uh, for anyone that's listening, they, you probably already know because you've read it. But here I am sitting with co-host Zach Albetta, and we're going to talk about you today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zach is in town uh, for Nam. We're going to try and uh, do some damage mm-hmm. uh, and just meet people. And so far, it's been great. And um, so. You had the opportunity to come from Atlanta mm-hmm. and be here and hang for three days, yeah. roughly. Yeah, yeah. So it's been good. Ate some good food so far. Yeah. Or tonight. Cornmeal pancakes, man. Pancake pantry. <laughs> um, so uh, if you're Nashville local, you know it very well. Um, and he was surprised at the line, but the line was surprisingly short. Yeah, they moved, to it, they moved it along. Yeah. Yeah. It's very good. Um, how are you, man? I'm good. I'm great. I'm, uh, thankful to be here. Thankful to be in your home. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about, uh, what's coming up for me and in my playing career and what's coming up for the podcast Yeah, and what's coming up for you. Cause you're going, you're going through kind of a, a little bit of a transition, a good yeah, one yeah. in your career. And yeah. I think it's a, it's a good season, man. Stuff yeah. is happening. Right. Right. Yeah. It's been fun. And, um, if we could dwell on the podcast for a minute, yeah. it's, um, it's been quite a journey. And I think that if anybody's been following it from the beginning, um, it was just kind of a lark that has turned into something that, um, has been a lot of fun and extremely educational mm-hmm. for m- just myself. Mm-hmm. And um, through uh, our uh, mutual connection and friend, Nick Ruffini, yep. uh, I was introduced to you and um, just th- with the idea of us working together. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know I mentioned it a little bit in the past and maybe we talked about it on Facebook or posted it, but we hadn't really um, talked about kind of what we're doing. All of a sudden, here was this podcast out of Nashville that I was doing and then here's we're splitting up the duties yeah you know uh ironically the first time we were able to meet in person was yesterday right um but it's been it's been fun to kind of like uh get to know you over the phone and Mm -hmm. everything like that and spitball ideas and see the work that you've done um i think early on uh, i was very uh, protective of the direction of this and how it was going and uh so a combination of things 
I feel like uh, your interview style, your interest, very much match my interest and, yeah, yeah. and style, which has been been, been great. Mm-hmm. But also, um, I think your ideas help elevate it, and so I appreciate it a lot. Oh, well, thank I know you, I mentioned man. it to you personally, but I just want people to know that it's been a it's been a fun uh, and. Um, I feel like you, they say two heads are better than one. Yeah. And um, the, the fact that we kind of have three working with in tandem with Mike right, Jackson right. as well. Um, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative to you because it's, it's given me like another, uh, another outlet. I had been doing a lot of writing and I still write. Um, but, you know, it's been, it's been great to sort of expand my, my skill set and my interests mm-hmm. through the podcast. And we've had, uh, you know, we've, we've made some decisions over the last six months about the podcast and it's always my default to just sort of, uh, uh, defer to you because Mm -hmm. this, you you know, you started this and it's Mm -hmm. your baby. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you'd be completely within your rights to put your foot down sometimes and say, Nope, I don't want to do that. That's Mm -hmm. not what, you know, but almost invariably Mm -hmm. you've been, you've been open to ideas and, and I've come to you with something and you say, yeah, man, go for it. Let's, let's see what happens. Yeah. I I think it's just bouncing ideas off other people Mm -hmm. and surrounding people with certain expertise. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think, and not, not holding on too tightly to what you thought it was going to be. Like if you have a preconceived notion about what this is going to be or, Mm -hmm. you know, where it's going to go or Mm -hmm. or whatever Mm -hmm. that can, I think, prevent, you know, growth and opportunities and whatever. I want to talk about the places you've lived. Well, where you went to school was <laughs> Kansas City. Right. That was grad school. Okay. Um, and that's, that's you know, Kansas City is, is pretty much where my adult life began. <laughs> <laughs> um, before that, <clears throat> I grew up in, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and mm-hmm. did uh, two years at University of New Mexico as a percussion major transferred to ball state in indiana um and ultimately ended up uh in grad school at the university of missouri kansas city right um and i say i became an adult there because that's that's kind of where um i formed you know some of my best friendships yeah that i still have and and through those friendships and and through the musical partners that i had it kind of helped me figure out uh, or at least start to figure out what kind of musician I wanted to be. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that there's, you know, my, <laughs> my life as a musician and a person, you know, definitely breaks down to before Kansas city and after Kansas city. Right. And, and going through this, that part of uh, your life is shapes many of us, uh, I think it has to do with age, mm-hmm. uh, and it has to do a lot of times when you're experiencing these this type of learning environment, whether it's in school or out of school. It, it, it that's where you make some really heavy duty friendships and bonds. Yeah, um, I ex- I think many people have experienced the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then your master's degree was in percussion performance and jazz and studio performance. Yeah, it was two separate master's degrees actually. Wow. It was, yeah, I know. It, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those those two master's degrees and and 3 bucks will get me a, you know, a coffee lot, cafe latte. <laughs> um but I, uh, I I did the two separate degrees because I I entered grad school as uh, to do the the classical percussion degree, the master of music, um, and I was the the graduate teaching assistant for the department and mm. and uh, went through that whole thing. But I was also active in the jazz department, um, playing in in uh, the big band and combos. And right. uh, Bobby Watson runs the jazz department at UMKC. Mm-hmm. I've talked about him before i'm sure uh you know he's an alumnus of art blakey and the jazz messengers and saxophone player yeah alto sax player yeah um so you know my my degree was in the in the classical percussion realm um but i was also playing in bobby's big band and and doing the combos and and i was nearing the end of my classical degree and I remember walking home one day and, and was like, man, I wish I could just, I wish I had more time to hang out with Bobby mm. uh, and just learn more from him and spend more time in the jazz department. Um, and I thought, well, maybe <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't really consider any possibilities outside more school <laughs> uh, for, for a long time. I, uh, I was just in school and I thought, you know, that more, more school is good. Um, 
So I approached Bobby about doing a jazz degree and, and he was able to get me a really generous scholarship to, to stay in school. Wow. And uh, so that, you know, I finished the master of music classical degree and, and the jazz degree is, is actually a master of arts. Okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I was, I was in uh, school in grad school for four years and the, the jazz degree kind of overlapped dovetailed on the end of the, the classical degree was your intention in, in the classical degree to kind of further that into a career at one time yeah um there was there was a time uh in my late teens and early 20s when i thought i wanted to pursue classical music as a uh, as a percussionist in a symphony orchestra yeah. and or as a, a solo artist playing, you know, four mallet marimba and, and, and all that. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of a, a recurring thought, uh, you know, looking back on it. Like if I, if I took all the time that I put into learning four mallet marimba solos and put it into drum set or put it into piano mm -hmm. or put it into working out <laughs> <laughs> or anything like <laughs> There's yeah. no telling. There's no telling what might have happened. So yeah, that was you know the 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 decision to pursue the jazz degree kind of coincided with the realization that I didn't really want to be a classical percussionist, mm -hmm. um, and that that path was it was forced on me a little bit uh, because I you know I started out on drum set obviously and. Uh, as I progressed through high school, I, you know, obviously was going to go to music school. I was mm -hmm. just going to go to college for music. That was right, it. Right. And, you know, my band director and, and even my drum teacher at the time said, well, if you're going to go to music school, you got to get your, your mallet chops going. You got to get some marimba going right. and do all that. So I started taking marimba lessons before college and was able to get into college. Um, and it just became the focus and, and right. drum set sort of. You know, I kept it going, but yeah, it yeah. was it was not the focus for a long time. Right, but it sounded like something caught your attention that wanted you that you wanted to focus on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the marimba is just a captivating instrument. Oh, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it really is, and and um, the fact that it's a solo instrument was was something new for me because right. you know, as a drummer, you're playing drum set in a band or you're you know, part of a drum line and a marching band or whatever, you're always part of a group. Mm -hmm. um, but the novelty of just sort of being, you know, it's all up to you. Like I'm, I'm, I've always been a big fan of stand up comedy. And I think the, uh, <laughs> there was something in my brain that sort of equated, like, it's just me up here and right. I am in complete control for better or for worse. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's part of, that's part of why I latched onto it. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's so many times when uh, there's a band situation where you're like, man, if I could just be by myself, this would go so much smoother. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's a sound check or travel or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, no, I get the appeal. Before we leave Kansas, I want to ask uh, something about uh, Bobby Watson. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw somewhere where you had written about uh, the performance aspect that he was trying to get across to you, mm -hmm. that connection with the audience yeah. that he was trying to convey to you that oftentimes uh, really accomplished drummers, accomplished musicians, mm -hmm. uh, jazz performers especially, yeah. um, where we have kind of a niche audience and it's more complicated type uh, art form, mm -hmm. is we lose that connection yeah. and what our job is to entertain. Yeah. And he used this term, that hug, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, the yeah, hug. Yeah. He said part of, you know, when, when people come out to hear live music, uh -huh. no matter what kind of music it is, he said part of what they come for is the hug. <laughs> and like he actually kind of like mimed, you know, he mm -hmm. put his arms around the air and he said they want the hug. And, and he, you know, he kind of expanded on it. He said they want to feel included. They want to feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. They want to feel appreciated. Mm. They want some sense of, uh, from you, the musician, are saying, like, I, I wouldn't get to do what I do if you didn't come see me. So thank you for coming to see me. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Let's have fun. Yeah. Here's my music. I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's really an all-encompassing concept about how you look on stage, how you act on stage, how you interact with the audience, both through your playing and just speaking to them. I can't tell you how many gigs I've been to or, you know, uh, not my gigs, but when I go to see somebody play, yeah, 
and they don't talk to the audience. They don't introduce any tunes. They don't introduce the band. They don't interact with the audience in any way. And, and maybe if they do, they're just not good at it. Right. Um, so, you know, I've, that made me, that made me more conscious of just, you know, being, being more open and more welcoming Mm -hmm. in, in every aspect of my performance. And it's not very often that I, you know, actually get on the mic and address an audience. Right. I'm not usually the leader on a gig. Um, but he was, but he was addressing you as a drummer, and he's he's got to know that sometimes we're often in the back. We don't have a, a vocal mic. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are exceptions. Yeah. But oftentimes, it's not our job to interact with the audience. So he must have been referring to something beyond that. Well, in that in that context, he wasn't actually talking to me specifically. He was like on a panel discussion gotcha. that, that I was watching. But he he said other things to me specifically. Uh, just about about my demeanor and my attitude, um, which weren't they weren't bad. They weren't repelling people, but I think he could tell that like I I had a tendency to take myself a little too seriously, um, both on stage and off, and and I could be uh, I could be kind of aloof and mm-hmm. just not you know so. Um, so yeah, there were, there were a few times when when he kind of urged me to just like loosen up, have more fun, help other people have more fun. Yeah. Um and uh and just, you know, it's it's something my <laughs> something my wife uh reminds me about too. Yeah. Um and I think in in my interview with uh Charles Lamont Garner, we talked about the the concept of, you know, people don't remember what you play or if mm-hmm. you're in conversation they don't remember exactly what you say they remember how you make them feel. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I think, you know, Bobby, Bobby could tell how I was making some people feel, mm. whether it was audience members or my peers. Right. Um, so he just, he would just kind of drop little hints about like, you could be, you could be nicer. <laughs> <laughs> you could be happier. You could be just, you know, it was basically loosen up. Yeah. You get more flies with honey than with shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. There yeah. should be joy. Yeah. Like Bobby, Bobby is a joyful player. You can hear it. Yeah. in his playing and there's humor yes. in his playing yeah. um and an- another guy who's like that is Matt Wilson mm-hmm. um i mm-hmm. went to s- i went to see him at uh the IAJE conference in New York it was probably 10 years ago by this point um but that was like right i was right in the middle of grad school yeah and i was i was an intense jazz head you know just like this is my art and it's fucking intense and yeah and, yeah you know yeah um and i went and saw uh, uh Matt Wilson and you know he plays he plays some out shit. Yeah, he plays yeah. some avant garde shit. But he's always smiling. He's like always visibly having fun. Playful is a great yeah. word for him. And he'll and he'll yell out like if he hears something he likes, he's like yeah yeah. Like he just kind of breaks this um, third decorum. wall. What did you say? Third wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with the audience. Yeah, he breaks that too. Yeah. Um, but you know his 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 decorum as a jazz performer was not like anything I'd ever seen. And mm-hmm. I would, and I found myself like smiling and having fun and, mm-hmm. and it just, you know, totally affected the way I experienced the music. Yeah. Um, so if you, if you play it with, with joy and with humor, yeah, people will experience it that way. I, you know, but it, it reminds me of maybe something, uh, that I know I've heard before, like an early Louis Armstrong recording of something live and you hear the audience interacting and you hear the band interacting. Mm-hmm. Um, but you hear that joy, and you're thinking, "Yeah, that's yeah. Why aren't we still doing that? Right. Because that's this is why we do what we do. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not all sitting around with black turtlenecks and just snapping our fingers. Yeah, you well, know, some to, of us are <laughs> <laughs> still. I, I don't know why I feel like I have to mention this, but uh, I, I just want to let people know that, like, if for those that don't know you playing, or you know, there's there's. Uh, luckily we have this medium we have this where we can go and so i mentioned this you, you the other day we'll probably re, uh, regurgitate a lot of our conversations yeah. over the last day or two <laughs> um we've been just been talking non-stop uh and uh it, when uh when i first started working with you and i was talking to my wife i said so i'm trying to figure out who this guy is who zach albetta is and so i'm going online i'm reading his bio i see the youtube clips and and I'm talking to her. I said, "And man, I gotta say, this guy's a killer player. He's a great player." 
And she kind of let out the sigh and said, oh, good. She goes, I thought you were going to say, he really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and how awkward would that be when I'm, when I'm sharing these duties with, with, you know, I want somebody that knows what they're talking yeah, about yeah. as far as what questions to ask and that. Um, that uh, I said it's it's refreshing, you know, and it's and I think stylistically coming from a different angle f- of what you're working compared to what I'm working on mm-hmm. right now. Um, so my point of all that is uh, it's it's no great facility, just wonderful. Uh, it's it's it, it, so go check it out. Anybody that's listening, go check it out. Thank and you, see what you're doing. And uh, the the Latin thing it, you have uh, it, the st- uh, about a half an hour YouTube yeah. on online drumming.com. Yeah. It's online drummer.com online drummer.com through that website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I say in that video and I should say again that pretty much everything in that video was, was me, uh, you know, regurgitating shit that I had learned from Doug Allwater, who was my, my drum mentor in Kansas city in grad school, master Brazilian drummer. He's the author of, uh, essential Latin styles for the drum set, which is kind of half method book, half textbook, um, and it's, it's, you know, half of it is Brazilian, half of it is Afro-Cuban, mm-hmm. um, and just a really, really great resource, uh, and a deep dive into, into those styles and, and what makes them authentic mm-hmm. and how to, uh, you know, translate styles that are not commonly played on the drum set in the traditional, um, in their traditional form, they're not played on drum set, but part of what this book does is, is translate yeah. all these rhythms and all these styles and all these voices and instrumentations for the drum set. Well, and, and I think one of the things uh, that he was stressing was playing these styles authentically. Mm-hmm. And, and I, maybe I'm just repeating exactly what you just said, but one of the, the challenges that I had, uh, maybe if we could just kind of address this, is that when I was, I really got heavy into Latin and Brazilian uh, music and I had a bunch of different books. I don't think I have have that book or mm-hmm. have had that book, and uh, and uh, I was able to utilize a lot of it, but not all of it. I'm sure it seeps into your style and your playing in one way or another. Mm-hmm. That was the biggest challenge for me is when we go through these books. When do I get a chance to use this partito alto groove? When mm-hmm. do I get a chance to use some of these things that are maybe more authentic? Yeah. As opposed to, look, we need to play uh, uh, Night Tunisia, and then we're going to play um, Girl from Ipanema. Mm-hmm. And just because it's because a lot of those gigs where you're playing those songs is at a dinner party, right? Is it a casual or a situation like that? Yeah. So I think what I'm saying is, were you able to find ways to really put this to use? Yeah, and a, a lot of that has to do with the scene in Kansas City. Okay. Um, I, uh, you know, different different jazz groups uh, around the city um, play different clubs, different types of gigs, but the i mean first of all the bass players are so effing good in kansas city <laughs> they all and i mean i i think part part of whether or not you actually get to use that partito alto style or whatever it is you're talking about mm-hmm. depends on the bass player yeah interesting. um because if the bass player doesn't know what you're trying to do it it won't work if he's playing the regular dun, 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 mm-hmm. you know the white guy latin thing <laughs> Your authentic partito alto that you've been working so hard to, yeah. to really swing in that particular way, yeah. it, like, is not going to work, and you have to default to the to the white guy Latin. Yeah, go um, go 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 yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and and that you know that hybrid partito alto clave, uh, uh, you know, half breed whatever that thing is. Yeah, um, I think that's what I think you're totally getting what I'm saying. Is yeah. a lot of times it's like this is great. We really dig into it, and, and we're trying to like be true and carry on this this authentic form of it, that's this beautiful music and bring it to the people. And then you get on the gig, and mm-hmm. you're just like, oh shit, I can't. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah, um, and you know, I think Doug is um, Doug is responsible for a lot of Kansas City uh, musicians and audiences alike being really hip to mm. Latin music and Brazilian music in particular. He's, he's the co-leader of uh, a group called the Sons of Brazil. Mm. Um, and, and those guys play as authentic as 
anyone. That's awesome. Um, so they've been they've been doing their thing in Kansas City for almost thirty years. So you know the audiences and the other musicians there just kind of have that in their ear, and they know to listen for it. And mm-hmm. uh, you know when when the drummer comes in, and you know the bassist knows that I've been studying with Doug. Mm-hmm. You know, the bassist mm-hmm. will say, "All right, let's let's see if Zach's been working in on his partito alto." Yeah, you know? yeah, I want to um, go to there. I want to <laughs> see that. Um, so the flip side of that is like, you know, it's, it happened a lot in L.A. I would I would end up on gigs um, that I, I wasn't able to do that, and most of the time it wasn't because of any lack of knowledge or skill on the bassist part or anyone else's part. It was right. because of the way the chart was written, um, you know, the the occasion that you're playing for. Um, it's just a much more mainstream pop oriented, yeah. uh, uh, thing. Mm-hmm. So you gotta, you gotta stick to the white guy Latin sometimes. I think there's so many examples, especially for those of us who've worked in an environment where charts are written out, uh, in whether it's a big band or, or jazz styles or other things like that. So this uh, music director is writing a drum chart and you're looking at it and you're like, I think I was the last guy on his list. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I remember in high school getting a, a big band chart and going, "Am I supposed to play snare drum on quarter notes on the snare drum for this jazz song? <laughs> what is, why does yeah. it say that?" Yeah, man, I took a jazz arranging class in grad school, and and you know, it was all it was all about the the horn arrangements and the harmony and all and all yes, that, which yeah. obviously is incredibly important. Yeah, but um. You know, there wasn't there wasn't much about what a drummer needs to see. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes the <laughs> the professor actually asked me, like, yeah. Zach, what does a drummer need to like? What's a good way to kind of put this? And other students would come to me and yeah. be like, This is what I want. Yeah. Like, what should be in the drum chart? Right. Um, and even that is a matter of opinion amongst drummers. Sure. You know. Sure, um, but you have to come in with a set of skills right. and knowledge beyond the band leader and and those. I mean. You, you you have to you can't just defer to what people are handing you right right you know and an, another thing that bobby kind of slapped me out of was was <laughs> just burying myself in the chart right he was like get out of the chart just right. listen love that just like not that you have to memorize the chart but but you know the more the more you can have your head up and be looking around and listening um the better and i you know i would get i would get caught up because you know i'd have my head buried in the chart and and uh, you know i'd be trying to execute whatever it was i was seeing in the chart and if it didn't match what i was hearing then i would i would figure out i would try to figure out a way to pencil something into the chart so that i could still look at the chart and 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 then what i what i was seeing would match what i was hearing but bobby was like don't don't change the chart fuck the chart mm-hmm. listen mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. I see that a lot with young players on cruise ships <laughs> that are given an, because they they have to learn, they have to sight read, they have to back up singers and artists that come on on and off the ships, mm-hmm. and a lot of them are well educated, good players that uh, have learned to read and sight read and do and it's it's all well and good. And I did the same thing, mm-hmm. and I was told get your head out of the chart, and I, I was it was that was a, that was stressed. Mm-hmm. And I think some people miss that because there's many times I've seen somebody, okay, here's a range that we have to do this walk on song for this comedian or something. Yeah. And they're playing an arrangement of an ACDC song with horns <laughs> and the drummer is playing two and four and his head is in the chart. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why is your head in the chart? Yeah. You really need to read back in black. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, it gets and it. It just, it frustrates me to no end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's a flip side to everything. On the flip side, there are some times when you need to read your ass off. Mm-hmm. And, you mm-hmm. know, if, if you've got your head up looking around or whatever, you are going to miss something important. Yeah, right. But that's usually in the context of like having little or no rehearsal. Right. Um, or a shout chorus or something where right. there's lots of hits and different things like that. But that was the thing because we were sight reading two or three charts every week. and And even during that time, the band leader was like, Matt, get your head out of the charts. There's 30, 32 bars of solo. Right. Feel it. Listen. Right. The sax player soloing. You need to interact with him, at least the style of big band that we were playing. Mm-hmm. Then 
when he's finished, then pick up where you left off. Right. You know? Right. And I think, I think arrangers could, could help in that way because most like the time that I find myself buried in a chart Mm -hmm. is when it's not an easy chart to read. If there's seven bars per line, uh, and you know, rehearsal letters are, are in the middle of the page, uh, and not at the beginning of a line, Mm -hmm. it just, it makes it impossible. So even though you might know that you got 32 bars of a solo, Mm -hmm. like I, I still find myself following sometimes just so I'll know. Oh, where everything comes back in. Right. So right. the you know the main the main thing I tell arrangers or composers like yeah. to you know to keep drummers happy is really easy. It's yeah. low hanging fruit. Like mm-hmm. don't put five bars per line right. unless there's a five bar phrase. Right. Put rehearsal marks and letters at the and beginning that, of a line. You right. know, don't don't uh, uh, split a shout chorus between pages. <laughs> don't put an open drum solo at the end of a page with a coda. You know, (laughs) (laughs) well, don't do that on your own charts when you're writing. (laughs) Right. What was the motivation for the move to L.A.? Um, I became a little bit restless. Um, Like I said, I I was starting to feel the need to sort of branch out of jazz, not leave jazz behind, keep it going. But, you know, venture into into other uh, styles of music because jazz wasn't got what got me into the drums. Rock was what got me into the drums. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. so I was feeling the need to return to that. Um, I had just gotten out of a relationship, so I was kind of, you know, taking stock and saying like, maybe this would be a time to make a change. Mm. Um, and I also, uh, started, um, I, I was becoming aware of, of how, uh, a place like Kansas City. I mean, first of all, it's very landlocked, um, and in in my in my mind at the time, there was only so high I could go if I stayed in Kansas City. Yeah. There was only so far I could go, mm-hmm. and uh, since I've left, people have proven me wrong about that. Um, but at, at the time, I you know I I felt like if I stay in Kansas City, I'm I'm going to keep doing the same gigs with the same people. And they're great gigs and great people. Right. But, you know, I want, I want more. I want different. Um, and the, uh, the turning point was uh, I had a lesson with uh, Michael Carvin, who is a, a you know, master jazz drummer and, and educator. Um, he's, he's one of those guys that not a lot of people know about. But there's a mm-hmm. great interview with him on, on uh, Drummer's Resource Podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you listen to that, uh, if you listen to that episode, you'll kind of get a sense of how Carvin is, is kind of a, a Yoda of drums, you know, do or do not, there is no try. <laughs> um, so I had had some lessons with him before. Um, and he, you know, he kind of knew me as a player and as a person. Um, and he had spent a lot of time in LA and I had this, Bobby would bring him in twice a year to work with the band, work with the jazz department, okay. teach drum lessons, coach combos. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he and I had formed a little bit of a relationship and, and I had this lesson with him and, and he's like, so what's going on? <laughs> like we hardly ever played in our lessons. It was just, it was just like talking and, f- you know, philosophizing and, yeah. and all this. And I said, well, Carvin, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about getting out of Kansas city. And, and he got a little smile on his face. He's <laughs> like, where, where are you thinking about going? Yeah. And he said, I, I think I might want to go to the West Coast. And his eyes got really wide. And he said, you're goddamn right. You go to Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, like he, and he, he could tell, like I was kind of restless. This, yeah. you know, I, needed, I needed to go to a big place and <laughs> you know, experience whatever was going to happen there, whether it was you know, making it huge or getting my ass kicked or whatever. He, yeah. he knew that. Or like, all the above. I, yeah, right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he knew that. that shaking things up was going to be good for me as a player and good for me as a person. Right. Um, so, you know, we talked for two more hours about, he's like, you know, as soon as you get there, you go to the, you go to the musicians union and right across the street on vine street is the, is the pro drum shop. And you go there and you can start hanging and start subbing for the rehearsals and, and on and on and on. I was like taking notes. Like (laughs) he he said, you know, get yourself a tuxedo. I already had a tuxedo, but, um, so, uh, so yeah, that was, that was the day. Like I walked out of that lesson. I said, all right, I'm moving to LA. Um, and 
that was spring of that was spring of 2009 and I gave myself until October of 2010. I mm. said I'm going to take the next year and a half. Yeah. You know, get my shit together, try to save some money, start digging some trenches in LA, go out there and visit. Um and uh it took me the whole year and a half, but in in October of 2010 I I did move to LA. Was there something that you did that worked? Was there something that you did that you thought would work that maybe didn't? Well, the the first thing that I thought would work that that did not at all was that I had um, business cards. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I was I was under the impression, um, you know, I was I was naive and and uh, prideful enough to believe that. Um, the you know the dues that I had paid in Kansas City and the the, the experience mm. that I had gotten there mm -hmm. was going to count for anything in mm -hmm. L.A. Mm -hmm. and um, it did not. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know everybody who comes to L.A. has well most people who come to L.A. have mm -hmm. paid some dues and have some experience and have some shit together. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know I was I was very I was very proud of the fact that I had cut my teeth in Kansas City and 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 sort of risen to the, the top of the heap there. Mm -hmm. Um, but ultimately it's a small town. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I kind of led with that. I you know, I, I led with, I'm from Kansas city. I studied with Bobby Watson. I, you know, I played with the people I played with in Kansas city. And of course, nobody in LA knew or gave a shit. A couple of people had heard of Bobby. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's like, Oh, you went to grad school with him. Okay. Call me when you make a record with him or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that was kind of the first wall I ran into, like, you know, after a few months of sort of trying and, and leading with that bio and that background, mm -hmm. um, I kind of realized like nobody cares. <laughs> well, and one of the things that, uh, a former interview, great drummer and teacher here in Nashville, Steve Eby mm -hmm. mentioned is you can't take your resume with you from town to town. Yep. It just doesn't work. Yep. Yeah. Like other vocations right yeah right um so uh yeah that was um that was the first challenge and the other the other challenge was just trying to figure out where to put my time and energy um because la is it, it's all of everything like all possibilities are open every part of town has stuff in it mm -hmm. you know it's not like you go to music row yeah. in Nashville and that's where all the shit happens and that's where all the people are. Mm -hmm. It's it's like somebody shook up a bunch of musicians and music venues and just flung them out. Mm. Scattered everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um so you know, I I think I um I I had trouble deciding. It was like paralysis through analysis, you know. Mm. And and when I decided where to go that night or who to go seek out, I put I put a lot of stock in it. I, you know, I, I was like, okay, I'm going, I got to meet this guy. Something's got to, something's got to come out of this trip right. that I'm about to make. Um, and it's not easy to get, I mean, it's spread out. LA is spread out and mm -hmm. it's probably depending on the traffic situation. It takes a while to get to where you need to go. Mm -hmm. no? Yeah. So you, you might as well, while you're there, do some damage. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but it was, it, it, it was it was more of a sense of desperation to get my shit together because yeah. I was living on on my girlfriend's good graces, uh, you know, <laughs> and and she was totally cool about it. She was you know extremely supportive and yeah. and continues to be. Yeah. Um, so it was wanting it, you know my motivation was wanting to do right by her and sure. and do right by the investment that she had made in me. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, so so there was there was a, a kind of a desperation about yeah, me, yeah. Um, especially at first. But what would you do, for example, like when you head out, when you were heading out, were you just to, just to see somebody, just to meet somebody, to hear them play, or maybe it was it a jam session type situation? Yeah, I would usually go to jam sessions, um, and you know, in retrospect, I wasn't very outgoing. I mm. kind of expected people to approach me, mm. um, and uh, you know, a, a lot of the a lot of the lessons I learned from my time trying to work into L.A. I'm now applying working into Atlanta. Um, yes. So, so yeah, it was, it was kind of what Bobby was talking about. Like I was a little aloof. I was a little mm -hmm. standoffish. I was, a, I was a little arrogant. Mm. Um, and, uh, 
you know, it's, it's not that, it's not that everybody gave me the cold shoulder. You know, I did, I did manage to introduce myself to people and have conversations with people and make connections. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would have knowing now, uh, knowing then what I know now, I would have been more persistent. First of all, I just didn't go out enough. That's a tough thing. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it was partly because I, I was, you know, being pulled in all these different directions. Do I go to the baked potato? Do I go to the blue whale? Do I go see some non jazz thing? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, do I, do I go to some place I don't even know about because this guy that I met is playing there tonight? Um, you know, it, it got going eventually. And what, what happened after a year and a half was that I got the, the Disney gig. Okay. Um, so the, the Disney gig kind of rescued me from having to go out and hustle. Yeah. Um, which was, a huge relief. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, having that gig now gave me an excuse not to, Yeah, you know, yeah. it made me a little complacent. And the, like the other thing about, you know, the beginning of my time in LA was that it coincided with the beginning of this relationship I was in. Okay. Uh, and, and she didn't at all, you know, put pressure on me to like, you have to stay home and hang out with me. Mm -hmm. You know, if anything, she was pushing me out the door, but mm -hmm. like I, it was the beginning of the relationship and I was retarded for her and mm -hmm. I wanted to stay home. I didn't want to go out and meet strangers and hear music that I may or may not like. I wanted to stay home with my lady yeah um and that you know that has obviously paid dividends in in my relationship and yeah. my personal life but it like that my time in la taught me that there's your there's you know you got two accounts you got your relationship account mm -hmm. and you got your career account and yeah. you got to make deposits in both and sometimes you got to withdraw from one to deposit into the other that's um, that's a good analogy yeah <laughs> <laughs> i like analogies i'm an analogous guy uh it's yeah i understand that yeah um the uh, the gig you had at Disneyland uh, is the Five and Dime Band. Mm -hmm. What is that? That is a f uh, a five piece band with a singer, so it's a six piece. Um, I see. And it was uh, the 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 beginning of that band coincided with the grand reopening of California Adventure in 2012. Uh -huh. um, so for those who don't know, California Adventure is, is kind of a, a separate but incorporated part of Disneyland. And it's almost as big as Disneyland itself at this point. Wow. Um, but it's just, it's like on the other side of that big divide um, that you walk through to get into Disneyland. Um, and it's, it's a California themed <laughs> theme park so there's a lot of stuff about about you know the early days of of flight mm -hmm. and um, chili peppers <laughs> <laughs> man that's a brilliant idea somebody should there's got to be a chili peppers band in california adventure <laughs> okay we're gonna edit that part out so nobody knows <laughs> that's my idea and you and you go okay <laughs> that's good we're gonna go pitch it um so yeah, uh, the five and dime band uh, was one of the few bands in Disneyland that was designed uh, to be in its space. Okay. Um, so there's a the, one of the parts of California Adventure that was part of the grand reopening um, was this uh, place called Buena Vista Street, which harkens back to uh, you know 1930s Hollywood. When Walt Disney and his brother came came out to Hollywood to make mm -hmm. it big, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the Five and Dime Band's backstory was, you know, we're we're from Chicago, we're a band from Chicago, and we drove all the way down Route sixty six. <laughs> see, to, yeah, <laughs> see, we're gonna play some jazz now. Um, so yeah, like our story was, we drove down Route sixty six to make it big, playing playing music for the for the picture shows, um, and we you know we'd come out, we had a little area um, in uh, in in. Uh, Buena Vista Street, mm -hmm. uh, and we'd ride out on this car, and the car kind of became part of our stage, and we'd do a little 20, 25-minute show. Yeah. It was the same show every day, every time. Uh, All of us had lines. Um, speaking lines? Yeah. Stuff like that? Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was your line? I had to tell a joke. <laughs> um, yeah, there were, like, there was... <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, towards the beginning of the show, I, I had to tell a joke. Um, was, the character, the drummer character's name was Baby. Uh, they named, you know, they named each character after a jazz musician. So he was named after Baby Dodds. And uh, like the guitarist says, hey, you know, hey, Baby, sling us a zinger. So the, you know, drummer has to come out, and and they gave us seven jokes to choose from in the script. 
Um, you picked the most racist one. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what Disney's all about. Um, no, like as a connoisseur of comedy, uh, the jokes um, uh, offended me because five of them weren't five of them weren't really jokes. Like I I I kind of stuck to the two that were actual jokes. Um, the other five just either weren't funny or didn't make sense to me. Um, so, you know, I'd come out there, Hey baby, sling us a zinger. And I'd say, you know why we're a five piece band? And the band says, no, why? And I say, cause we only know five pieces. Rim shot. That was you the know. best one. That was the best one. Holy crap. Yeah. At Jill at corporate love these others. I don't know why. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, you're, you're, you're touching on, one of the things about Disney that is that is weird and a challenge to musicians is that right. it's a corporate environment. Disneyland alone employs twenty seven thousand people. Yeah. Um, so it it took a lot of adjustment for me to you know it's like office space. It's like if office space ran a theme park. You have eight bosses. You're being told the same thing every day. Yes, I got the TPS, TPS report. report. Right. Um. So so yeah that that was a lesson in doing the job. What is it that you do here <laughs> basically <laughs> oh my gosh yeah it's amazing yeah um and you know five years prior like coming you know in in my heyday in kansas city i would have like that job would have eaten me alive i would have self-destructed i would have given them the double bird and said i'm out of here yeah um but you know a little a little more maturity and a little more humility right. after a tough year and a half yep. in LA sure. and it wasn't that I didn't gig at all in yeah. that year and a half you know I got I got things here and there but it just wasn't consistent yet okay um so you know by the time by the time it came time to do the job at Disney I was ready to do the job Other gigs in LA uh, uh, that um, helped keep you busy, or yeah, I played uh, a little bit with with Pete Chris Lieb, um, who is a great tenor saxophonist. He mm-hmm. he recorded some of Steely Dan stuff and oh, wow. and Tom Waits way back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, saxophonists know know who Pete Chris Lieb is. He was a great guy. Um, I did a lot of sub work. Um, you know, I subbed for Jamie Tate, and I I subbed nice. for a bunch of the guys that hung around the Union. Mm-hmm. Um, there was there were big band gigs. There was the odd recording session. Uh, there were private gigs. There was some club stuff. Um, most of what I did in in L.A. was was like sub work and one offs. I see. You know, yeah. and and it was the last year or year and a half. I became a regular member of uh, the Jennifer Keith Sextet, um, which is like a vintage swing retro outfit. Okay. Um, and uh, what was your joke in that band? <laughs> <laughs> my playing was my joke in that. Day. No. Um, but that was, that was a really great gig. It was, uh, so Jennifer Keith is a, a great singer. Um, her, uh, band leader is Mondo Durami, who's a tenor sax player. And he was the founding member of Royal Crown Review Oh, cool! back in the nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, I got, I got recommended to Mondo and I almost didn't get that gig because of my own miscommunication. Like I was, I was on uh, I was on a driving range. Like I'm not really a golfer, but I just decided to go to the driving range one day. My phone rang and it was Mondo, and and he told me, uh, uh, "Yeah, man, uh, you know Dean Mora, this other band leader." He said, "Dean Mora recommended you, and I got a I got a four night run coming up in Vegas, mm-hmm. and you know we're kind of between drummers right now, so like you know wondering if we can kind of try you out on this weekend, and then if if shit feels good, there's going to be a lot more after that." And he told me what it paid and I don't know why, but uh, like something about the way he said it made me think that the number he threw out was for the whole weekend Oh, okay. for all four nights. Yeah. And I already had a gig book for the weekend he was talking about. It was, yeah. you know, one night that yeah. paid almost the same. Uh-huh. And I, like, I just started balking. I was like, you know, man, I got another gig book that weekend. I don't know if I can get out of it. You know, blah, 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 blah. blah. And, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he was like, you know, you sure, you sure you can't do it for like this, this much per night. I was like, whoa, wait, wait, per night. Yeah. yeah. Per night for all four nights per night. Yeah. He was like, yeah, that's what it pays. And I was like, oh fuck that other gig. Yeah, I'm uh, absolutely. (laughs) And it was funny because the, the gig I had booked was with Dean Mora, who who was the guy who had recommended me to Mondo. So (laughs) I had to call Dean and say, Hey Dean, 
thanks so much for recommending me to Mondo. Now I have to bail on your gig. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, but Dean was totally cool about it. He was That's... very, very gracious. So that, you know, that gig almost didn't happen. But because I, I worked out my miscommunication, you know, that ended up being a year and a half with that band. That was, that was a great band. I, you know, there are, when we decided to move away from L.A., you know, there were a lot of things that I was happy to leave behind or mm-hmm. just indifferent to or whatever. But leaving that band hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it 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 sucked to have to leave that was there uh, something about the style that was new to you or something that you had to adjust to to be in that band that you hadn't experienced before yes um mondo said i know you're overqualified for this job <laughs> yeah um and he had told me about like he he set me up to succeed by telling me the ways in which previous drummers had failed and mm-hmm. he didn't talk shit about anybody by name but like people he had auditioned before who didn't work out that was kind of him right yeah because people he's, don't do that no he's a very close to the vest dude and like yeah. but but he he said you know this this gig and this music is not about getting your jazz out it's not about bebop mm-hmm. um we swing mm-hmm. for sure. That was the hardest swinging band I ever played in. Mm-hmm. But he said, I'm not looking for chatter on the snare. I'm not looking for a bunch of interaction between soloists. He was just like, swing, knock out backbeats, play time, mm. set shit up. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was a really meat and potatoes gig. And, and I, I thought of it like a rock gig. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm playing in the jazz style. I'm swinging along, splang, splang, alang. But my mentality was uh, was in a rock band playing two and four. Yeah, you know, just being a big a big couch for the band to sit on. Right, right. And it even it even came down to solos. Mm. Um, like Mondo, you know, Mondo will work out a solo and play it the same way every time. Um, mm. And we one of the one of the drum features for the band was this uh, song called Topsy. Yeah. Uh, you know, the old Cozy Cole thing. Yeah. And he said, I, I need you to play this solo exactly the way Cozy plays it. I transcribed it. Yeah. Um, and again, my, my younger self would have been like, it's a, it's a fucking drum solo. Like, yeah, I, yeah. you know, yeah. I want to I wanna improvise. I want to do something, yeah. you know. But Mondo said, I, I need you to play it this way. Yeah. So I, I transcribed it. I played it note for note every night. And eventually, as, as time went by, I started... I started taking a few liberties. Yeah. And, you know, by that time I had earned the right with Mondo. I see. Mm -hmm. Um, And the liberties that I took, he was receptive to like right in the middle of it, like Matt Wilson, he'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it was uh, just a, a, a great lesson. It reminded me of something Michael Carvin said about like the, you know, working out, working out a solo and playing it the same way every time or playing someone else's solo. He's like he he said don't don't think of it as as regurgitating something or don't think of it as copying think of it as reciting. Mm. It's like you're reciting a poem. Yeah. Um and that was like it it finally clicked for me like this cozy cole solo is a poem and just mm-hmm. cuz I didn't write it just cuz I don't get to improvise mm-hmm. doesn't mean I mean it doesn't make me a hack. Yeah. I get to recite this thing. I get to pay tribute to it. Well, even if it's your composition, even mm-hmm. if it's your solo, and I struggle with that because when I, the few times I these days that I have a chance to do something, uh, a solo or improvise, I'm thinking, uh, like, what if I come up with a plan? I mean, yeah, you want you want the situation to inspire you mm-hmm. uh, because it's hard to because you never know. Mm-hmm. On stage is different than in the practice room, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. uh, I always felt a little guilt in organizing something beforehand. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, that's cool. I like that. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. I want to ask you one more question before we leave LA is, um, what did you do? What happened with Jamie Tate that put you on his radar? So I first met Jamie when I was still in Kansas city. Okay. Um, he came through town with David Benoit to play a big benefit um, I don't even remember what the benefit was for, but there were multiple musical acts playing for the benefit. My trio was one of them, and we kind of opened for David Benoit. Okay. Um, so I met Jamie then. 
uh, and he was already in LA and doing great, obviously. Um, and that was, that was before I even had designs on moving to LA. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I did, um, I remembered that he was there. I still had his number. Oh, cool. Um, but I didn't actually call him up. I saw him at Nam. Mm -hmm. I went to Nam my first year in LA. It was like three months after I had moved there. I had no business being there whatsoever. <laughs> I didn't even know what I wanted to accomplish. I just knew that it was a thing in LA to go to Nam. Mm -hmm. So I fucking went. Um, and I spent two days there. You know, again, I wasn't very outgoing. I was kind of aloof. I was intimidated. It was just sensory overload. And, you know, by the end of the second day... Are you day, predicting tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Hopefully better equipped to deal with it at this point in my life. <laughs> right. Um, it was the end of the second day, and I was just exhausted. I was sitting in this hotel lobby, just kind of messing with my phone, and and I saw Jamie from about 100 yards away. Um, and I was like, that's that dude. Yeah. That's Jamie. Yeah. Um, and I almost I almost didn't go up to him, like because he was talking with other people... Um, and I was exhausted. I was just intimidated. I was like, I, I'm going to make an idiot of myself. I have nothing to say. I'm just, ugh. Mm -hmm. um, but I, f I feel like, again, I made this trip. I have to come home with something to show for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I just went up to him and, and introduced myself and he remembered me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, we talked for a while at Nam, and, you know, he got my phone number and, and within, I think a couple of weeks he called me and said, Hey, can you sub? Um, or no, it was before that he took me to the union. So the musicians union in LA is, is a big thing. Lots of bands rehearse there, mostly big bands. A lot of the guys who are doing session work in, okay. in LA, um, just sort of propagate these bands and some of them meet once a week or once a month and they just get together and read charts. Yeah. Um, so Jamie had been doing that for a long time and he, he took me to, uh, the rehearsal. He was playing a rehearsal for Steve Spiegel's band and Steve Spiegel is a, you know, renowned composer, arranger for big band, awesome. uh, in, you know, high school, college, you know, mm -hmm. um, and he just, he brought me in there and I watched the rehearsal and, uh, they took a break and Jamie went over to Steve and said, Hey, this guy, Zach just moved to town. He's a buddy of mine. You think he could like play a tune or two? Uh, and and you know they let me play a tune or two i don't remember what but i yeah. just you know i read a big band chart <laughs> doxy and, and <laughs> solo. Yeah, this yeah. guy knows it. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah like i i played a couple tunes and and sounded good and a little bit later you know spiegel called me to do a rehearsal and yeah. through doing that rehearsal i met horn players i met yeah. bass players so eventually like that was that was a big part of me kind of creating a network of of colleagues that's in, awesome in la that's awesome yeah no I, you just never know mm -hmm. uh to, to strike when the iron's hot and you know, just sitting in that uh, hotel lobby just probably overwhelmed and exhausted mm -hmm. to um go ahead and going for it and meeting them. that's that's awesome yeah uh when when i first was introduced to you and we started uh chatting and stuff you were living in la mm-hmm and then uh, the opportunity came, a career opportunity for your wife mm -hmm. to go to Kansas, to go to Atlanta, mm -hmm. was there. So would you still be in L.A., you think, if she had, that hadn't come up? Or? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, she, she had been kind of over L.A. for a little while yeah. by that point because she had lived there five years longer than me. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, but you know, she, like her, her career was going well there. And, um, my career was also going well between Disney and all the other stuff I was doing with Jennifer Keith sex Ted, It was like, you know, finally, I kind of, I kind of on solid ground here. Um, but the more I remember we had, we went out to dinner for our first anniversary. This was, this was last August. So this was less than a year ago. And, um, we had come back from Kansas city. We had visited Kansas city. She loves Kansas city. I love Kansas city. And it was over that dinner and a couple bottles of wine <laughs> that we kind of realized, or I kind of realized like I might be done with LA sooner than I thought I was mm, up until that night. I had been thinking like five or 10 years out. I never really thought that I was going to spend the rest of my life there. Yeah. Um, but you know, I was going to give it a longer run and, and right, um, right, right. And, uh, you know, Christina looked at me across the table, half cocked on wine, and she was like, I would move to Kansas City tomorrow. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's like 
that's a hell of a statement. And it made me realize like, man, moving to Kansas city tomorrow would be sweet. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Cause you know, I, uh, as, as well as my career was going like living in LA, will just beat you down. Some yeah. people thrive on it, right? but right, I understand. you know, it's just such an expensive pain in the ass to do anything. Mm -hmm. Going to fucking Trader Joe's, let alone anything cool mm -hmm. involves parking validation and, and you know, insane traffic and, yeah. and whatever. So it was at that moment that I realized like sooner than I think I may have either accomplished what I, whatever I wanted to accomplish in LA and be done with it, or I will no longer want what I thought I wanted mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so that just kind of, but opened. you had to go to know that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I don't regret going at all. Right. Um, and, and there are some ways in which the town kicked my ass as a musician and a person. Some of it beat me down. Some of it built me up. Right. Um, but it made me, it made me a better player. It made me a more mature human right. that like Kansas city is where I became a, an adult, but LA is where I really sort of grew into myself yeah. as a player, as a man, as a husband. Yeah. Um, and you know, Christina played a huge role in that obviously. Um, through her support and her right, kind right. of that's awesome building me up, you know. But um, but I yeah. think players that are thinking about going to someplace new, you just do it. Yeah, just go. Yeah. And a lot of times it's not about the destination; it's about getting out of your comfort zone. Right. Right. And it's, so it was a chance to kind of start over with a clean slate and apply all these lessons that I had learned in L.A. Um, and when you were going to Atlanta. Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, that dinner, our anniversary dinner kind of got the wheels turning a little bit about, you know, maybe, maybe we're not hanging here as long as we thought. And so, you know, the universe, <laughs> the universe said, Oh, you crack that door open a little mm -hmm. bit. Let me just kick it all the way down. And a month later, Christina got this job offer. It wasn't an outright job offer, but it was like this, this company in Atlanta approached yeah. her. She had been on their radar for a long time. Nice. They wanted her bad. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, you know, after it, it took a, it took some consideration, you know, it wasn't an automatic decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the end we decided, like you said, go for it. Let's yeah. have, let's have an adventure. Let's right. experience something new. Let's experience some place new. Yeah. It was a great opportunity for her. Yeah. And, you know, I felt, um, I felt I really owed it to her, mm -hmm. uh, to, to take this leap because of the investment she had made in me when I first got to LA and all the support she gave me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if she had gotten a job offer in Lincoln, Nebraska, or, you know, <laughs> Boise, Idaho or something like we'd still be in LA, <laughs> but you know, the, the initial, after we got over the initial shock of like, Oh, this is Atlanta. What do I know about Atlanta? Right. Nothing. Mm -hmm. The more we dug into Atlanta, the more I got hip to the music scene and, mm -hmm. and talked to other people about it, mm -hmm. the more it was like, this seems like a great town. It sounds like it's, and it's proved to be. It really has. Great. It really has. Yeah. And everybody in LA, like, you know, I talked to people and everybody was like, oh yeah, I know a musician there. My brother lives there. Oh, like even my brother, you know, he spent time in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. He went to college there, but I told him about Atlanta. He was like, dude, Atlanta is one of my favorite cities. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so yeah, the more we heard about it and the more we learned about it, it was, it, it became, you know, a much easier decision to kind of take this leap. How long ago did you move to Atlanta? New Year's Eve. Okay. And we're in June, it's yeah. June 22nd. Yeah. So in the last six months, Man, you're busy. <laughs> I'm I'm getting there. Yeah. I'm yeah. Happy. No, it's great. Uh, so, uh, new lessons, new things that you applied when you got to Atlanta. Yeah. Um, the first was just just go out every night. You know, I there were there were various things holding me back in L.A. Some of them legitimate, some of them not. But there were there were a lot of reasons why I wasn't out as much as I was. Mm -hmm. um, or as I wasn't out as much as I should have been mm -hmm. in LA. Right. Um, and Christina was on board. She said like, when, when you get to Atlanta, like go, yeah, yeah, yeah. go hang, yeah. you know, be out every night. Yeah. I, and I, I took lessons from, you know, friends of mine that I'd seen move to LA and just work their way in very quickly by just being out every night. And right. even, even going back to Kansas city, yeah. there were guys that moved from Kansas city and I would see them all over the place. And within a few months they were, you know, in the scene. Yeah. Um, so 
the first two months, like I was, I was going out not every night, but like four nights a week. Yeah. Um, and you know, Christina would, (laughs) we had this rhythm for a while. Like Christina would come home from work. I'd cook dinner. We'd eat dinner. We'd hang for a little bit. She'd start winding down, getting ready for bed. I'd get dressed and get ready to go out. Yeah. Um, and our phrase became, see you in bed. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, and, um, she gave me really good advice about my approach when I go out huh. for, you know, first of all, she encouraged me to be more outgoing and, and, and more inquisitive and more approachable with people, which I found easier than I thought. I think part of it has to do with the South. People in the South are just like so friendly, so welcoming. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah. it made it easy to kind of right, right. step out of that comfort zone a little bit. But not, not in a pestering kind of like, Hey, right. can I get a gig? Uh, exactly. You know, call me, call me. Right. But, and so the other piece of advice she gave me speaks to that, which is she saw me hustle in LA. She saw me go to a jam session or go to Nam and, and come back feeling like I hadn't accomplished anything. I hadn't made the connection that was going to lead to something and just kind of dejected. Yeah. So she said, when you go out in Atlanta, just, hang don't feel like you have to meet a certain person or or come home with a certain like just go experience the music scene Mm -hmm. as a listener Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and get to know it that way Mm -hmm. instead of instead of trying to work an angle at every venue and with every person you meet like there's things at work that i don't think you would recognize yeah on your own Mm -hmm. someone may see you at the second or third time and like who's this guy Mm mm-hmm Who's this extremely tall dude who <laughs> seems to be watching the band and knows what's going on? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that that was a really um, <clears throat> useful, valuable, insightful thing for, right. for her to suggest. Yeah. Um, and props it, to her, man. Yeah. That's awesome. She gets props for so many things, you have yeah. no idea. Um, but it, it, it made the, not only did it yield better results, but it made the experience so much easier and and more enjoyable for me because of, you know, instead of stressing about making the connections and doing the hustle or whatever, I was, my, my focus was on the music. Mm -hmm. What is this band doing? Mm -hmm. What does that guy sound like? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. um, what kind of music does this venue have where Mm -hmm. it's, you know, two or three months of that, um, yielded a lot of good results. And I've, I've already made some really close friends in Atlanta. Atlanta Funk Society is a, a, a group of, depending on the gig, it be, can be a five piece or a seven piece or a ten piece. Oh wow! Um, and uh, yeah, they do like you know uh, hits and B sides and deep cuts from the '60s and '70s. Yeah, Sly and the Family Stone and the Commodores and Chuck Brown and yeah, um, uh, yeah. The it's it's the brainchild of uh, this amazing bassist uh, Kevin Scott. Uh, who's from Alabama, but has lived in Atlanta for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, so much fun to play with. Like he's, he's a bass player who plays the bass. Like mm-hmm. he could, he could give a shit about getting up on the neck and, and dancing around up there. Like he wants to play low grooves. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Was there any heads up advice kind of like the other situation in LA no Uh, or was it just come in and kill it yeah yeah. it was just come in and kill it actually (laughs) um he mentioned uh you know i think i I saw them once before um and he and i were talking and and he was like you know i like i like a drummer that really lays into it Mm. and you know when i when i saw him like the whole band was laying into it i was Mm. like i don't know if i can lay into it that hard (laughs) um you mean like volume wise yeah, and just feel. Yeah, yeah. You know, just presence. It's not not necessarily volume, but just right, like sure. presence, commitment, just deep groove. Uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. and and yeah, it's definitely about volume. I've never been a heavy hitter. Uh-huh. Um, I've I've had to like work out a little bit. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, to to prepare for that gig because um, it it requires sort of a, a strength and an endurance that. Um, I haven't I haven't needed very much, mm-hmm. and from right. for I think for most drummers it's not a super high bar as far as heavy hitting. But for me it was like okay, no I get gotta it, muscle up, right, right. Um, Other gigs I know this group Delta Moon mm-hmm. has not begun yet, right? That's starting in July. Okay, and what's that? 
Delta Moon is a, a four piece uh, kind of blues roots outfit, um, and it's it's drums, bass, and two slide guitars. Oh wow! Um, and slide guitar is is like it, that's a southern thing for sure. Mm-hmm. Like you know, Derek yeah. Trucks in Florida. Sure, and, sure. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know where Bonnie Raitt's from, but it's like it's that vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, so Delta Moon has been doing its thing for 15 years, I oh, think. Wow. Okay. And, and they, you know, they've won awards in, in Blues Matters and Downbeat and mm. Tom Gray, the, the leader and songwriter has won songwriting awards. That's awesome. Um, and it's, it's a really great band. It's just a, like the, the songs are just these kind of stripped down three legged stools of, of, you know, a, uh, Mark, one of the guitarists said, we put. You know, our, our basic MO is to put blues slide guitar riffs over dance grooves. Mm. Um, and, you know, when I thought of a blues band before, I thought of more kind of swingy, shuffly, swampy, yeah, right. whatever. This band is like groove. It's hard groove. More straight eight stuff? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Uh, sounds like it sounds awesome. Yeah. And, and it was another one of those things where it was exactly what I was hoping to get into because even when I was still in LA, I was starting to listen to more roots music and Southern music. I was getting into Jason Isbell mm-hmm. and uh, drive by truckers. And, you know, I had always been into Lyle Lovett. My parents yeah, were into yeah, Lyle yeah, Lovett. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and Tedeschi trucks band. Yeah. Like I was listening to this Southern music and like, holy shit, this is wicked mm-hmm. like these grooves are so deep and these and songs, swings yeah 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 i think another reason that that i was able to kind of work my way into a few different things like you know funk society and delta moon was um that i one of the mistakes i made in in la was laying all my cards on the table and hoping they were received favorably just like telling everything about myself and my background and mm-hmm. what I do mm-hmm. and, and hoping that whoever I'm talking to will be like, Oh yeah, you can do that here. Um, as opposed to just playing it closer to the vest, mm. not dropping any names, mm-hmm. um, just being a little bit intentionally vague about mm. what I did in LA okay. and just kind of letting people come to their own conclusions about what my background was or what I wanted to do. Um, and if uh let your playing speak yeah yeah mm-hmm. um my friend my friend ty bailey gave me that advice because he like he could see that my tendency ty bailey is a, a keyboardist for for katie perry and a, a b3 player that i played with quite a bit in la one mm-hmm. of my good friends there so i'm getting ready to move to atlanta and like he knew this about me he knew that that if that left unchecked i would go to atlanta and say hey my name's zach i came from la i played at disneyland i did this that and the other <laughs> and and he knew that that would not go over <laughs> um, yeah. but he said just be a little bit mysterious like don't lay everything out on the table right away like when you create a relationship with someone maybe you've played a couple gigs with them yeah. then you tell them about disneyland then you tell them you went to grad school for jazz yes you know? yes um and it really like that was one of the best pieces of advice that, that yeah I, that i got Three things you have written down on your website, mm-hmm. which looks great, easy to navigate, to the point. You have drummer slash educator slash writer. Mm-hmm. I think we've covered, we know what you're doing drum wise. Mm-hmm. Educator, are you teaching? Yeah, I've always taught lessons, you know, here yeah. and there. And, and I've done a few clinics. It's it's not high on my agenda. Mm-hmm. Um I have two master's degrees. I'm qualified to teach at the university level. Mm-hmm. I haven't yet, but it's it's something that I'm kind of keeping on the horizon. Right, right. right. And mm-hmm. if I was to take a college job, I wouldn't want it to be the super deep jazz dive that most colleges are. I would want it to be a more vocational mm. approach, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, sort of equipping drummers with the skills they're going to need to go play a wedding gig or go yeah. have a successful Disney audition yeah. or something. And it's not that... Which makes you a good host for a working drummer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the last thing you have is writer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, where does that come from? Um, that comes from my parents. Uh, my, my dad is a lawyer. My mom mm-hmm. was an English major. Okay. Um, so there were, there were always lots of words floating around the house. <laughs> um, I was never a super voracious reader. Um, you know, I, I, I do read, but you know, a lot of 
people who write for a living just you don't like Coltrane you don't read I know jeez I'm, man uh, just all sorts of confessions picky man. about jokes yep I'm, I'm, I'm unburdening myself <laughs> <laughs> um, you know and I, I, I do read but I, right, I was right, right. never I a voracious student of it um, yeah it's it's uh, I, I think part of it goes back to my love of comedy and mm. my first like my first favorite comic was George Carlin Right. And his jokes and his act is composed. Like talk about reciting something. Yeah. He doesn't do crowd work. He doesn't riff. Yeah. You know, he writes his shit out mm-hmm. and it's so beautifully crafted and, and there's turns of phrase and puns. And yeah. so like I kind of, that's one of the things that made me fall in love with, with language, with crafted language. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and what I want to get to is, is you were finding places within, uh, just mu- your music and drumming career mm-hmm. to because uh, I met you through uh, uh, Nick Ruffini and he was talking he was first telling me about you that you were doing some writing mm-hmm. for drummers resource mm-hmm. for his website yeah. I was like that's interesting you know as opposed to just writing himself you know, writing for himself but actually bring somebody in yeah. and I'm like I, I guess I had that was kind of new that was a new idea for me well it, it came from kind of a, a, a need like I, I saw kind of a gap in the drum market and drum education and and drum literature and it's it's not to say that it wasn't out there maybe I was just missing it but I wasn't seeing anything about like basically what this podcast is about like mm-hmm. like street level working shit right you know like you you watch a lot of the DVDs and they go through the coordination and the the yeah. seven eight over five four and yeah. the fucking left foot clave and mm-hmm. and all that and it's cool but. I don't, I don't care. Like what I, I want to talk about what we do every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to talk about music, fuck drums. I want to talk about music and mm-hmm. the music business. Yeah. Um, so, um, the first article I ever wrote was for percussive art society. And it was when I still lived in Kansas city and it was about playing drums behind a jazz singer. Um, mm-hmm. Because uh, one of my best friends in, in Kansas City is a great singer named Shay Estes, with whom I played for a long time, and I was kind of her partner in that in that quartet. I would arrange for her, and, and we made a record together. And um, playing with her, uh, like I said, kind of made me realize what kind of drummer and what kind of musician I wanted to be. Mm-hmm. And and playing with her taught me that playing behind a singer is very different from playing behind, you know, a quintet with two horns. Yeah. Um, so I just started thinking about this. I was like, this is a useful skill. This is, this is something that Marco Miniman doesn't cover on his DVD. <laughs> um, and I, I pitched it to Percussive Art Society, and they were like, cool, write the article. And, and it ended up being really long. I'm kind of in love with words. My <laughs> wife is always editing me. Um, but, you know, that, I, that was a, you know, seeing, seeing my article in the magazine, I was like, this could be a thing. You know, I might, yeah. I might have a little bit yeah. of a voice yeah. and a point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead of just talking about all the drumistic stuff, yeah, I can shine a light on, um, you know, the, the more overarching musical concepts or the, mm-hmm. or the business stuff or, mm-hmm. you know, so yeah, I, I just started, I started doing it. I, I got a suggestion to like approach existing blogs and ask if you can do a guest blog. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started working for Nick. I I called up Nick Ruffini. I was like, Hey man, I dig your website. Like, can I do a guest blog thing? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. So I wrote one and he dug it and he was like, you want to write some more? You want to just be like contributing writer for drummers resource? And I said, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, online drummer.com, the website that I did that, uh, those instructional videos for right. the guy that runs that Nate Brown contacted me and, and yeah. said, like, I'm looking for more content for my website. Can you, can you write some stuff? Can you do some interviews? Can you, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I wrote for him too. And, and I parlayed that into writing bios for my fellow musicians because I would go to people's websites or mm-hmm. band websites yeah. and the writing was just, Oh fuck man. Yes. <laughs> No, I understand, and and, I, and I'm not a great student of writing. Right, and, but what, and what I what I, I just it, said, I, I re- even I recognize that. Yeah, what I just said was kind of dickish. Uh, no, but like, no, I'm, it's it's it know. it can do it can do some damage. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I know it needs to be said. Yeah. Um, so please. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like the you know effective writing on your bio or your website can yes. can really um, it can really help or hurt, and I um. 
Or if you're trying to make a point on Facebook, please, proper grammar. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was not only grammatical, it was just like the whole approach. Like, and I was guilty of it in the past too. I made my bio just a list of the people that I had played with, most of, her, most of whom no reasonable person has ever heard of. Um, and I learned through my wife and, and through other people sort of who are more hip to writing than I am that if you're, if you're going to pitch yourself in writing, you, you have to pitch yourself to someone other than people like you. Yeah. As a drummer, I shouldn't be pitching myself to drummers. I should be pitching myself to yes. band leaders, to bookers, to fans, to audience members. Um, mm -hmm. And what's in your bio has to be compelling to them. It can't just be a list of names that they don't know. Yeah. It has to be like your story. Where did you come from? Why do you do what you do? What do you get out of music? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what it, like you can, you can read in my bio um, what I want to put forward in a performance and what you're about to experience. So yeah, I've written, I've written uh, a few bios for, uh, you know, friends of mine or people, people who contact me mm -hmm. that friends have recommended me to. Um, and Are you making a pitch right now? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Anyone. Absolutely. I will yeah. write your bio. I've enjoyed that. And, and it's become, you know, an extra source of income mm -hmm. and another way to, to just be expressive. And I hope that this as well has been a way of expressing yourself. Absolutely. I like if, yeah. if nothing else is true about me, I'm in love with the sound of my own voice. So, <laughs> so getting to just talk with guys and, and, um, and just, you know, chit chat about, about yeah. what we do has been yeah. really great. And like you said, I've, I've learned so much just in the 10 episodes that I've done or whatever. Like yeah. every time I talk to someone, they bring this perspective. That's just, mm -hmm. you know, totally yeah. different from mine and totally useful. Yeah. Well, again, I, I, I appreciate your perspective. I appreciate what, what you're bringing in and, and just, again, it, it, it helps keep me on my toes. I feel a certain responsibility as this has grown from just me and then Mike and now you mm -hmm. and now the listener and, uh, and a lot of the um, interviewees as well. I feel a certain responsibility going all the way back to David Black, the first interview I did. Mm -hmm. It's evolving, yeah. you know, if you will. And it's exciting. Um, as they say all the time, thanks, man. Yeah, Appreciate thank you it. so much. Let's make dinner. Absolutely. Let's all right. Let's cook. We're going to do it. So there you go. Uh, there is Zach Albetta. As you can tell, we are on our way to make some dinner. That's another uh, one of the talents that Zach has. Aside from playing and writing and just being an overall cool guy, he likes to cook. So uh, that was cool. And uh, it was good to get to hang out. He came to Nashville. We spent about three days together uh, going to NAM, going to some NAM events, talking about the podcast, talking about life, talking about our wives, all and everything in between. And it was just good to uh, get to know somebody that you're uh, working uh, as part of a team to put this podcast together. And I'm excited to have him help me out with this and uh, kind of building on our team. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed that, his perspective in moving to a new town uh, and going where he needs to go for his family uh, and uh, making it happen. Uh, is, uh, it's so helpful and it's a scary uh, thought when you think about going to a new town, but uh, hopefully he's offered some perspective that will be uh, of some use. As always, my thanks to Mike Jackson for his technical assistance. Stay tuned next week for Zach's interview. He will be the host, not the guest. And I appreciate everyone's support in listening and input. And I hope to see you around. Bye-bye.